If you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24 for scripture reading as Andrea comes forward. That's Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel for the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for all witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Every guest that's invited to this pulpit has a purpose. And every minister who stands here has a mission. The invitation to Pastor Andy Weaver, uh, when it originated from a conversation between the two of us, occurred with the objective twofold. First of all, for us to learn more about what God is doing at the church, West Salem Anabaptist Adventist Church. And then also with the ministry, West Salem Mission. And often we blur the two and see them as synonymous, but they are separate. And so he's going to explain to us how they function, what they do, and the ministry that God raised up when he brought both Pastor Andy and his lovely wife Naomi to the Adventist <clears throat> message. And so I pray that we will listen with a desire to learn and also learn how we can benefit or support what they are doing. But the second purpose for anyone who stands at this desk is to give us a word in due season, to share with us what God is doing in and among his people and what he would have us to do for these times. We thank the Lord for the ministry that is occurring and, and continues to bless many people, both Anabaptist as well as Adventist, both locally and even nationally. I pray that you will pray for Pastor Andy as he speaks to us. Well, thank you, Pastor Samuel. For the introduction, I, um, I feel a special bond between myself and Samuel when I go to pastor's meetings and elsewhere I see Pastor Samuel and I feel a special bond. We obviously have the same values. We love the truth. We love authentic Adventism. I think that's one thing that really bonds us together. Uh, we, are, we understand that the truth never changes. However, at times it needs to be, we need to um, customize it, if you want to use that word, to, to, for, your, for the people that you're reaching out to. However, the, the foundation, foundational truth never changes. One of the things that <clears throat> attracted me to this church was the fact that I, was, I listened to speakers and I spoke with an individual that let the Bible interpret itself. I did not know that that was possible. We had a testimony at our church today. <clears throat> One of our ladies was in Amish country this past week, and somehow she started talking with an Amish couple or an Amish man at a store, and the Amish man was, they started talking about the end of the world. And so they talked about the mark of the beast, and of course this Amish man was very concerned about the mark of the beast. and. So the lady from our church, she asked him, so what do you think it is? And he says, I don't know. I think it's the Internet. And so they talked for a little bit, and then finally he goes, well, what do you think it is? And she says, well, if you look at the book of Daniel, and she, she referenced the chapters, and then she says, you know, she referenced Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 14, and where it says that the beast is a, um, a kingdom. And she says, the first beast in Revelation 13 persecuted Christ. Well, I don't think it's news to any one of us that there was no internet around at that time. 
and then she uh, she said that then she referenced the second beast that would that would be kind of like the first beast and then she was quoting this and she said the the, the wife you know walked up and they lift, listened intently and they go what were the chapters they said we've never heard anything like this where she they, she they said you let the bible interpret itself and she said that her whole demeanor their demeanor changed they were like we never saw anything like that and i told neom i said my wife and you and I were there at one time. We never didn't know that was possible. Let the Bible interpret itself. Amen? Amen. So let's sail a mission. We started in, well, I was going to say we started in 2015. We started a long time before that when Phil was out there under the, the stars uh, preaching to me at my house. But the West Salem Mission was, was officially established in 2015. We were baptized in, into the church in 2014 and then it was um, established in 2015. And uh, the West Salem Mission is not part of the Ohio Conference, although we're part of the World Church via ASI. The Seventh Seventh Church has made provisions for businesses that are run by lay people, such as I think Samuel Thomas has a ministry that is, that is supportive of the church, but not run by the church. That's the, what the West Salem Mission is. West Salem Mission is a self-supporting independent ministry that supports the world church now as we ministered to our community uh, we ended up with a congregation and so the congregation rents the facility from the west salem mission weekly and that local church community is part of the ohio conference so that if i just hope that clears up any confusion that they may there may be now the West Salem Mission, what we do there is we have a group of people that we just spearhead evangelism to the Amish communities, Amish and Mennonites, and of course anybody that we can reach out to. But we look at materials that can be produced to reach a, a people group in our backyards that really haven't been reached other than, you know, we have had a lot of faithful um, coal porters that knocked on doors and gave out a lot of books, so lots of CTEP and so on. But as far as making available a platform or a... Uh, community for, you know, a community for like-minded believers that would embrace the Sabbath. That's where West Salem Mission comes in. Now, just a few things that we've produced in the last year. Number one is our Bible study guides. Now, most of you are probably familiar, I'm sure you're familiar with Amazing Facts, the story of a prophecy. They are quite good. I mean, they are really good, I think. However, they were put together for Net 99 for New York City. And there are no Swartz and Trooper Amish in New York City. And, you know, for a number of years, we used these study guides, and they were great because they go through all the, all the uh, um, fundamental beliefs and the things that are needed in, in preparation for baptism. But um, as I got more established in the truth and got to know my Bible a little better, I realized that there's a lot missing in those historicals of prophecy that is needed for Amish people. And then it also, it covers, there was, we would do certain studies and I'm thinking, it's kind of a waste of our time because an Amish person is like, of course, of course, you know, you can trust the Bible, that kind of thing. And so last winter, by, by God's grace, I, I wrote new study guides. We got permission from Amazing Facts. We kind of follow the historical of prophecy and a few of them are almost identical just because like the 2300 day prophecy, I'm not, not really capable of improving what they have. Maybe in the future I can customize and make it a little, more, a little more friendly towards Amish. So if you have Amish friends that are open, I really encourage you to uh, consider this. Now, it's, I know it's hard to give them a Bible study guide, so what we're doing is we're making up, a, uh, um, making up cards that are Bible study correspondence invitations. And so if you have Amish friends, I highly recommend you give it to them. And if they, if they send it in, we will send them, send, them, send them one study at a time. And I believe this is going to be a, a real major tool to reach Amish people. And number two, the Arise um, conference project that we did. Now, many of you, I think some of you have seen this. So there's a lot of Amish people that have landlines, whether it's usually it's in a phone shanty outside, and there's also a lot of Amish people that have flip phones and they have unlimited call because they have 18 siblings and so they have uh, unlimited um, minutes and so <clears throat> we built this system where they can call in and listen to a wide variety of sermons on their phones um, so i'm going to leave this here we'll we, we open it up and if you want to take one you can take it 
um, check it out. It's, it's good for anybody. Um, there's been a lot, I mean, there's whole churches that have bought them by the you know, hundreds of thousands and given them out. And there's, there's a lot of people listening in every day, uh, just listening to sermons that otherwise wouldn't listen if they, don't, if they have to go on the internet. Now these are little, um, little cards that are the same as these. They're just a little more friendly. I want to give somebody a business card size. Same thing that introduces them to the, uh, the Arise phone conference. So 100 and almost 200, I think now, presentations in one book, in one little folder. So if you want to do outreach, I encourage you to try these. So that's what we do at West Salem. Plus, we, uh, like I said, we have a local congregation. Most of you have been there. If you haven't been there, I invite you to come worship with us. We do worship in the morning, so Che would fit in good there. Um, <clears throat> and I always tell people, um, the only requirement is that you grow a beard without a mustache. And we have some minor exceptions for ladies. But, uh, <clears throat> but we hope you come and worship with us sometime. It's an honor and privilege to be here. I helped my, or we held our membership here for a while. And uh, when I was baptized, it was a little unique situation. I, my, um, uh, my uh, or our, I should say, our membership was elsewhere, I think in Virginia for a while, and then it was moved to Fredericktown. And uh, eventually, of course, taken to West Salem. So we continue to grow there. And... Um, we praise God for that. So if you have supported our ministry, whether it's financially or whether it's your prayers or any, in any way, I want to thank you for that. Um, if you want to support our ministry or whether it's our school, we have a, our own school now. And if you have any interest in um, um, scholarships, that those are needed. Um, you can visit our website. Uh, otherwise, just pray for us and come visit us sometime. We'd love to have you. Amen. So let's get into word. Let's talk about something that will change our hearts. We we'll spend some time in the Bible today, and before we do that, I'd just like to invite you to bow your head one more time, and then we're going to pray. Father in heaven, we're just grateful for your word. We ask that today, as we go through the word, that the word would go through us, and that we would be washed clean once again. Father, we want to see Jesus, and we want to see the issue of our time, the issues of our time. So that we can be not only relevant, but we can be, we can be awake, and we can be watching, and we can be ready when Jesus returns. Please bless, let the Holy Spirit be our um, be our teacher today as we spend our time together. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. I'd like to start in the book of Peter, First Peter. If you want to go there with me, First Peter, and chapter three. I'm going to put this away. I'll use my cordless mic. I can move around a little bit this way. 1 Peter chapter 3. And here in 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to learn that there's a time coming that it's going to be a great blessing. A lot of times we talk about the great time of trouble. But there's also a great time of blessing coming before Jesus returns. We're going to see it in this first verse. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. And I'm going to, be, going to be reading from the New King James Version today for those of you that may be using your phones. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, it says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. So Peter is telling his congregation, he says, Look, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, which we know is going to happen here in the near, to fear, uh, near future, we are going to be blessed. Now, if you think about it, there's not hardly anything more miserable than to be a backslidden Christian. Isn't that right? Lukewarm Christianity stinks. It's not fun. You go through the rituals. It doesn't come from the heart. You're miserable. You're just trying to buy your way to heaven. But when persecution comes, we're going to be, going to be very close to God because we have to. We're going to spend a lot of time in prayer, and our Christian experience is going to really improve. So the Apostle Peter says that if we suffer for righteousness' sake, we are blessed. And verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, I titled my message today, Our Problem. Our biggest problem today is the fact that we don't know what we believe, and we don't know what the real issues are. We don't know that, we don't understand that all the deceptions that we read about in the Bible, 
Whatever deceptions Satan brings, they're just a repeat. They're painted differently. They may look differently, but at the end of the day, they are a repeat. Now, we're told in the spirit of prophecy, the thing that, make, that made Paul successful in his ministry was the fact that he was not ignorant of the devices of the devil, of the enemy. And we read that in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. So Paul was successful, obviously, because he was a spirit-filled individual. He loved the Lord. He understood scripture. He understood truth. But he also understood how the devil works. And today we're going to consider some of the strategies that are used today, even within Christianity, that really represent Satan. And we want to be aware of those. Otherwise, we'll be beguiled by them. I'd like to go to Matthew chapter 24 from here. Matthew chapter 24, and this is a very familiar passage that I think Pastor Thomas preaches from a lot. So if you're tired of him preaching from Matthew 24, I apologize. But uh, I'm going to preach it again today. But Although we're going to look at something a little different. Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to start with verse 7. It says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, I believe that is where we are in earth history right now. We are in the beginning of sorrows. And now, number 9. Then, notice the, verse, the word then in the next few verses. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, according to this verse, the issues at the end of time, are they local or are they global? It says we will be hated by all nations. Now, do you think all nations are going to resist us because we, because we insist that children should obey their parents? No. You think all nations are going to resist and hate us because we don't bow to a literal, literal idol or we don't believe in idolatry? No. The issue is, 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 well, we know what the issue is, but it says here that this is going to be a global issue. Whatever the issue is at the end of time is global. It will cause every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to hate us. Isn't that interesting? All nations will hate us, and that is, that is where the gospel is going to go. And then look what happens. Verse 10, And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Now is the time, if we have to overcome putting up barriers and, and, and becoming cold towards one another if things get hard. Sometimes when, you know, when we just get struck and on and on and on, the controversy goes on and on and on, what do we do? We put up walls. We just get tired of it. We put up walls. We avoid people. We just say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my own little world. You know, who cares about the rest of the world? But God's people are not going to do that. Amen. Verse 13 says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. If we are dead in Christ, we have nothing to do with consequences. We're told in the book Great Controversy, God's people have everything, everything to, do, to do with duty and nothing to do with consequences. Amen. We are dead in Christ. Whatever happens, happens. We're going to be faithful to God. That way, I tell you, when I'm on my deathbed, I want to look back and say I was not a coward. I did what I could. I was faithful to God. I know that if you're like me, I look back and I know that many times I could do better. I, there's days that I'm a coward. I'm just tired of the controversy, right? I just, don't want, I just don't want to talk about anything controversial, but sometimes we have to. And now verse 14, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So all nations will be against us, but we in return will preach the gospel to all nations as a witness to truth. Now there's one very important word in here. I don't know about your circles. You're probably not as much exposed to it. But in my circles, in the former Amish circles, the word this in verse 14 is very important. There's a controversy today whether the gospel of Paul is the same gospel as the gospel of Jesus. It is believed that the gospel of Paul is different from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
And if you believe in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as authoritative gospels, you are accursed. Because Paul says, if you don't please preach the gospel that I preach, you are accursed. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we'll find out what Paul says about the gospel. 1 Timothy chapter 6. So we're going towards the end of the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to start with verse 3. The Apostle Paul says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, which means reform, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings, etc. So, according to Paul himself, should we heed the words of Christ? He says if we don't, we are proud. So the Apostle Paul is not preaching a message that differs from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's a myth. And that's what happens when we have a narrative and we are determined to sustain our narrative. And so we start singling out certain portions of the Bible. Now the gospel has two elements, grace and justice, mercy and justice. We can see that in John chapter 1. Let's go to John chapter 1. Here the apostle John talks about Jesus and he touches on these two elements. John chapter 1 and we're going to start with verse 14. And notice these two elements. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Grace is unmerited favor, forgiveness, and the power of God. Truth is what cuts. We tend to want to go light on one or the other. If we're conscientious Christians, we might go, we might go real strong on the truth part. And forget the grace part. Or if we want to, if we want to be passive, we go heavy on the grace part. I think one of the things that made Jesus so impressive, his ministry, his his uh, preaching, was the fact that Jesus found a perfect balance between justice and mercy, Amen. because he's God. Amen. When I first read the book Desire of Ages, that was the one of the big things that pulled me in. I I never understood that you could actually reconcile law and grace. I did not, I had no idea. But the book Desire of Ages is, in, in, as far as modern writings, is the best example I believe that we have anywhere of a perfect balance between, between justice and mercy. The law and grace are, bothly, are both um, expounded in that book very well. Now, verse 15 in John 1, it says, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was born of me. Now, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. So the law was given through Moses. So we get rid of the law because grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. We want grace and truth, not law. Is that right? That's the narrative. And we need to understand this because these issues are going to become very real and they sound so, so true if you don't know your whole, you know, your issues in the whole Bible. What is truth? Well, we know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody argues with that. And here, right in this chapter, John chapter 1, it says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is the embodiment of the Word of God. But what else is truth? Jesus said in uh, John, cha John chapter 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is the truth. But there's something else that is truth. Let's go to Psalms 119. And some of you are probably very familiar with this. Psalms 119. We're talking about grace and truth. Psalms 119. So we're going to the middle of the Bible. And the Bible is going to tell us what truth is. <clears throat> Psalms 119, verse 142. It says, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. 
truth. I had somebody tell me one time, and did you hear that this Amish person is coming to the truth? And I thought, what does that mean? And I was told, well, he's leaving the Amish. I'm like, well, that doesn't mean he's coming to the truth. The word of God is the truth. And it says your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. So what is the natural question? What is righteousness, right? What is righteousness? Just a page over, Psalms 119, 172. It says, my tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Now, will the false prophets of Matthew 24 that rise up when the world becomes cold and lawless help with the lawless problem? What do you think? It says in Matthew chapter 24, which is we just read that the, church, that the world will be lawless and many false prophets will rise up. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus addresses the false prophets and the false-hearted believers. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to see whether we can trust half-hearted Christians to help with the real issue, which is lawlessness in our time. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And now, that gives us a little bit of context. Now, in, chapter, in verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who, and he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in, wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that practice lawlessness. So do these false prophets help with the problem of lawlessness at the end of time? No. In fact, they themselves are lawless according to this. Now, let's exam let's, let, let us examine the, this gospel that Jesus said would be preached in all the world. He says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And you're very familiar with this, but we're going to look at it again. Reve Revelation chapter 14. Revelation, so in Matthew chapter 24, it's recorded how Jesus is saying, things are going to get really bad, and God's people are going to respond by preaching the gospel of Jesus into all the world. And here in Matthew chapter 14, or in Revelation chapter 14, John in visions sees the fulfillment. Check this out. And then Matthew chapter 14 and verse 6, it says, And then I saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Is this the gospel that Jesus was talking about? Yes, it is. When Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, this is the gospel that will be preached in all the world. Now notice what kind of of uh, emphasis we have just a little before that it says it goes to every nation tribe tongue and people now verse 7 saying with a loud voice fear god and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come who is preaching that message today you know who's preaching that message and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Now, why would the first angel's message, in the first angel's message, why would this part of the fourth commandment be quoted? But it's, yeah, because it's been forgotten. Have you ever read the parable where Jesus said a woman had ten coins? One of them was lost. And then when she was sweeping her house, she found the coin... And she had 10 coins again. What did she do? She rejoiced and told everybody. That's what happened with the early Advent movement. Amen. They swept through the word of God and they found the lost coin. And so they, so they but they, even before that, when the first angel's message was preached by the Millerite movement, they were like the early church. The early church believed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what they said. But they believed that he came, uh, he came to, set, uh, to, to establish a literal and earthly kingdom. So they had the um, event, they had the time right, they had the event wrong. And so 1844 was a perfect repeat of the early Christian church. 
they had the time right, but they had the event wrong. Now, some people are critical and they say, oh, look, that movement is illegitimate because they prophesied that Jesus would come and he did not come. Now, if you read Revelation chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 25, which talks about the ten virgins who went out to meet the bridegroom, and it gives us, it gives us context in Matthew chapter 25, because in Matthew chapter 24, he talks about the darkening of the moon and the, the sun and the moon and, and the falling of the stars. And then in chapter 25, it starts out with what, what kind of word? Who knows? Then. That's very significant. Then, the kingdom of heaven. After the falling of the stars, after the moon turns into blood, after the sun, and the sun has been darkened, which all happened prior to 1790 or 1844, I should say. Then it says, the kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins who went out to meet the bridegroom. And the bridegroom did not come. So the very thing that is used to ridicule the movement is what makes the movement legitimate. Now if you think about it, if this makes the movement Ill illegitimate, then the early testament church was illegitimate. Because they had the event wrong, but they had the time right. A repeat. Both of them went through a great disappointment, and a church was born out of it. The first one was the New Testament church was born out of a great disappointment, and the second one was the, the remnant church that was born out of the great disappointment. So the very thing that is ridiculed was prophesied. Read Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 has William Miller written all over it. We're not going to go there, sorry. We don't have time. I'd love to. Verse 8 in uh, Revelation chapter 14. Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, just a little side note. Why would God, why, after the first angel's message was preached, the second angel's message says, Babylon is fallen. When does condemnation come according to Jesus? Is someone condemned for being in darkness? No. Jesus said, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and man loved darkness rather than light. That is why Babylon, the second angel's message says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And she has made drunk, all nations with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Let's just check something out. I read something recently in my devotional that I thought was very interesting in the light of this text. Isaiah 29. Let's go to Isaiah 29 together and we read about wine that is not, or drunk, being drunk that is not by little and wine. Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29. So we're going to the middle of the Bible and we're going to see something that a, that, con, that contributes to the second angel's message. Isaiah 29 and verse 9. It says, Pause and wander. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. Now, if you think about it, <clears throat> Babylon says that we cannot live a righteous life. So when, when you get stopped by cops and the cops assume that you're drunk, what do they make you do? Walk a line, straight line. Can a drunk walk a straight line? No. Neither can we walk a straight line in this world if we don't believe we can. If we're drunk with the wine of Babylon, we can't, we indeed can't walk a straight line. Now verse 10, for the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep. Babylon, being drunk with the wine, which is the Lord pouring out His spirit upon, uh, the spirit of deep sleep upon us, and has closed his, your eyes, namely the prophets, and He has covered your heads, namely the seers. Verse 11, the whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. Do people believe that the book of Revelation is sealed? Babylon believes the book of Revelation is sealed. Which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, 
Read this, please. And he says, I am not literate. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with me, with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. What is the issue of the end of time? The commandment of men. Babylon being drunk with the wine of Babylon and blind, blinded by the deep spirit of sleep. Back to Revelation 14. Verse 9, Then, it, then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And now check this out. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's what we're trying to work our way towards. How many elements do you see here? Two. God's end time people. They preach the everlasting gospel which is the three angels' messages, as we call it today. And they have the two elements that we read about in, in 1 John 1 that Jesus had, grace and truth. They keep the commandments of God, and they have the faith of Jesus. What is faith? That's the big question today. What is faith? The faith that is being promoted today, I don't want to be hard and negative, but <clears throat> the faith that is being promoted today is not faith. It's presumption. The faith that is being promoted today, and I'm just saying this because we need to be very aware of these issues, because it's deceptive. It, it, the things are not always the way they look. The faith that is being promoted today is the faith of Cain. Think about it. God told Cain and Abel, I want this offering. Abel just brought what God told him he wants. Cain brought more. He brought something different and more of it. Have you ever heard the phrase, I keep every day holy? Do people keep every day holy? No, they don't. The Bible says the day is to be kept holy by not working. So Cain brought exactly just a simple offering, what God told him. And Abel trust, just trusted God. He just put his faith in God and says, look, God is going to be happy with this. I'm going to bring all the fruits of my garden. God is going to be happy with this. Is that faith? But didn't Cain have faith that God would accept that? It was presumption. It's the alternative of faith. <clears throat> Let's go Romans chapter 10. This is very important. Romans chapter, Romans chapter 10, we're very familiar with this, but we need to put it in our minds. Romans chapter 10, and verse 17. It says, and so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What does this mean? This means faith must be biblical. Biblical faith is biblical. So we don't say, I just trust in God even though it's not in harmony with the, with the Word of God. It must be in harmony with the Word of God. If we, if we accept what God has told us to do, if we accept the, the authority of the Word of God, that's faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now let's look at another prime example of, of uh, the wrong kind of faith. Matthew chapter 4. Here we're going to read the story of Jesus' temptation. Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to see an alternative faith. Matthew chapter 4. And notice what happens here. We're going to read this and then we're going to go to Psalms 91 and we're going to read what the devil was quoting and see, and to see if you catch what is missing. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 5. This is the best example of presumption. It says... Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, 
lest you dash your foot against a stone. So Jesus is tempted the first time, and what does he do? He quotes scripture. And so when he's tempted the second time, guess who quotes scripture? The devil quotes scripture. And so let's go to Psalms 91, and let's read what the devil is quoting and see what you see. See what, if you can catch what's wrong with what he, the way he quoted scripture. Psalms 91, and I'm going to start in verse 7, because many times when we look at, we are tempted to look at God's promises to us, and we don't look at the conditions. It says in, in uh, Psalms 91, verse 7, A thousand may fall at your, at your sight, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Verse 8, Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Verse 9, Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Verse 10, No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. So what is the context of this? Plagues, natural disasters. That's the context of the statement. And now we're going to read what the devil quoted. Verse 11, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hearts, in, the, in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. What was wrong? Uh, for 39 years Minus the years I couldn't, it was too young to read. I, I missed it. I found it last year by listening to the book Desire of Ages. I thought, ah, oh, how did I miss it? What is wrong with the way? Let me, let me read what he said. I'll read it to you. And then I'll read Psalms 91. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, ooh, yeah, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. <clears throat> Now, let's go back to Psalms 91, and I'll read it to you the way the devil, the devil quoted it, and see, and see if you catch it. <clears throat> Verse 11, For he shall give his angels charge over you. Verse 12, In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. What did I just do? I left the portion out, which is exactly what the devil did. He left the condition out. To keep you in all your ways, that's the other element. That is obedience. Amen. He didn't quote it. Isn't that fishy? That's exactly what he did. But Jesus knew his Bible well, and so he caught it. So when this, when, when this promise was given, it was talking about natural disaster and pestilence and all these things that are out of our control. It has nothing to do with presumptuous uh, chomping off of a temple. And then he quotes part of this scripture. But this is, the, this is a... This is something we need to be very aware of. When scripture is being quoted, it's everything being quoted. There are two elements of truth. It's grace and truth. <clears throat> the deceptions these days are very real. We can listen to preachers that sound so biblical until we hear a, a rebuttal. We must learn the issues of our time. Amen. The issues are the commandments of God, right. and the faith of Jesus. Yeah. We have no excuse coming to the judgment seat of Christ and saying, well, I didn't know that if somebody t takes one of the commandments and teaches people not to keep it, that, that was a problem. When Jesus told us, that is a real problem. And when James told us, that is a real problem. There is no excuse. But we must be very aware, Scripture is being used, like the devil used Scripture, to mislead people. And some good news. How can we live a good life at this, at this time? 1 Peter chapter 3. We can get all bogged down with the troubles of this world and the false prophecies and everything. Or we can choose to live a good life. 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, I'm wrong here. Where did I say we are going? 1 Peter chapter 3. That's what I put down. Let me see. Romans. Sorry, 2 Peter. All right, thank you. 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Let me see. 
Second Peter, I thought I had a note. Where was I at? Second Peter chapter 3. I know where it is. Yeah, First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Sorry, First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. <clears throat> this is what we need more than anything today. We have a thousand things that can divide us. But there's, this is no time for division. This is the time where we stand together. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. God's people, Revelation, in uh, Matthew chapter 24 says, instead of becoming cold, they preach the gospel as a witness to all the world. Verse 10, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his, refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the faith of the Lord is against those who do evil. We need the two elements, justice and mercy, grace and truth. Anything else is a boat on the wild waters of the ocean with one oar. And we go in circles, in circles, in circles. When God has called us to go on unto perfection. To grow up in the full measure and stature of Christ. Amen. And that's my message to you today, my appeal to you today. Thank you again for inviting me. God bless you. I wish you God's blessings on this church. I hear that you guys just um, redid your leadership. I wish you well with that. I trust that the Lord was in it. And um, again, I hope you will all come and visit us sometime at our local church. God bless you and thank you and have a blessed Sabbath. <coughs>
Father in heaven, we're grateful that you have given us your word. You have sustained your word throughout the centuries. We're also grateful that the, for those that went before us, the generations that have carried the torch of truth from generation to generation. Yeah. And we look forward to meeting them and spending time with them and thanking them for their faithfulness. Yeah. Father, we know that you know that we live in a world that can get very confusing. Help us to, st st to uh, stick very close to your word, to always test everything by your word. Help us to be faithful Christians. Help us to love you. Fill us with your spirit so that we can rightly represent you in everything that we do. And now as we go to our homes, we ask that uh, you would go with us, that your angels would surround us and protect us and keep us safe and help us to be a blessing to the world and to those around us this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. And uh, as I said, come see us sometime at West Salem.